Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. I'm Father Roderick, and it is time to record another podcast. And this is going to be a little bit more of a traditional episode of The Break. Um, if you've been following my show for the last couple of weeks, I've focused a lot on Doctor Who and Star Wars and uh, anime. Uh, but I, since I've been um, coughing a lot and just uh, not feeling very well, this past week, I figured I might as well just switch back to uh, my traditional format because that's something I can do without much preparation. So um, it's a bit of a um, an old fashioned show. Feel free to join me in the in the comments. By the way, I may want to turn on the window for the comments because otherwise I won't be able to see what you're what you're typing. Uh, let's see. There should be a window somewhere. How do I do this? Do 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 window. Bring all, no, um, where is it? Comments and reactions, there we go. Hey, Steve. So let me put that here on the right. And then I think I can close the WhatsApp window. Do righty. So many windows, so little time. <laughs> I might also turn off Apple Music, just in case I press a button by accident, and it starts blaring out copyrighted music. Hey, Colin. Hey, Flydevic. Listening in Scotland. Uh, sorry, in Stockholm. I my my eyes read Stockholm. My brain says St Scotland. <laughs> hey, Raja. Watching from Kerala in beautiful India. Good to see you. Um, I'm I'm sure that uh, many other people will join us while. I'm streaming, <clears throat> and we've got Pika as well. Uh, I'll be talking about Baldur's Gate 3 today, among other things, because I have a... Oh, now I know why, why my brain said Scotland, because Colin says that he's watching from Scotland. <clears throat> we'll be talking about Doctor Who as well. It's funny, I didn't even read the comments, but... Somehow, like in a flash, I, I probably saw Scotland and then I saw Stockholm, which has similar letters, and then my brain just made a wrong connection. Uh, my apologies for that, but welcome whether, wherever you are in the world. Wish I could join you. I've, I, I want to go back to Scotland. I miss Scotland. And I've never been to St Stockholm, believe it or not. That is an entire part of Europe that I've never visited. All right. Um, so, I always have to double check if everything is ready, especially if the show is not on autopilot. Let me turn that off. That one should be full volume. I've got the jingles. I'm good to go. All right. Let's see. Um... Hey there, I don't know if it's time for a break, but I'm definitely going to take a break. So join me for the next, what is it, half hour, 45 minutes, depending on whether you are a patron or just a regular listener. We're having a lot of, uh, wait a minute, I, I, I lost my train of thought. I, there was something I wanted to say and then I was like, ah, hold on, let's do this again. Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of The Break. I am Father Roderick, I'm a priest and I'm a geek and I love to talk with you about everything I'm passionate about. Doctor Who, Star Wars, we're going to talk about uh, the Red Rising Saga and so much more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. This is going to be a bit of a, an old fashioned show because I've been... Um, struggling with uh, like a lingering bronchitis and so I just didn't have the energy to sit down and, and prepare everything so I figured well what the heck we're just gonna do like a an old-fashioned show I do not like movies they're predictable like the guy gets the girl and that kid sees dead people and Darth Vader is Luke's father not liking movies is like not liking puppies they're fine I just get bored and never make it to the end you know you need a movie education you need a movication. I'm going to give it to you. 
This week we saw already the last episode of the 60th anniversary Doctor Who specials. This was episode number three, which also marked the transition from the 14th Doctor to the 15th Doctor, um, which was something that we all knew was coming, but the way in which they did it was surprising to say the least now of course i'm gonna keep this spoiler free but i just wanted to tell you that i thought that this third episode was actually uh the best of the three and i already really loved the first two ones but this third one had everything and it felt like they crammed in content for maybe even three episodes into one episode it was so much fun um the special effects were top notch um they this this episode featured um and this is in the trailer so it's not going to spoil much but the the famous or infamous um toy what was it the toy not the toy maker the the toy yeah i think it was the, the toy player now i now I, i'm not sure anymore anyway no the toy maker is that from from marvel well, what, what what was it called uh let me see the toy was it the toy maker doctor who toy Toy, 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 toy. No, don't Google toy. You know what? I gotta, I gotta redo the show. I hate it when I don't have my ducks in a row. Doctor Who. What was it? The toy maker. Yeah, it was a toy maker. Okay, my apologies to the live audience. This is this is sometimes what happens, and I'm just like I I realize all of a sudden that. I need it. I just, I I tripped over myself. Uh, trailer toy maker Doctor Who. Let me just start with this one. I'll just play this one. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, this is also. Sometimes I have these days where. It takes a while to get going. All right, here we go again. Take three. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Break. I'm your host, Father Roderick. I'm a priest, and I'm a geek, and I love to talk about Doctor Who. We're going to talk about Christmas series on Netflix. Uh, I want to talk about pasta, and I'll review the book Morning Star in the Red Rising Saga. All that and much more coming up in this episode of The Break. And this is going to be a bit of an old-fashioned episode of The Break. I didn't have much energy to prepare the show. So I figured, um, since I'm still struggling with this lingering bronchitis and I want to take it easy this week, why don't we just do an old-fashioned show with old-fashioned jingles like this one? How do you not like movies? They're predictable. Like, the guy gets the girl and that kid sees dead people and Darth Vader is Luke's father. Not liking movies is like not liking puppies. They're fine. I just get bored and never make it to the end. You know, you need a movie education. You need a movication. I'm going to give it to you. This week, we saw the third episode of the 60th anniversary Doctor Who specials. And this was a very brief story arc, and this is the first time in history that Almost everyone in the world had access to these episodes the moment they aired. Normally, of course, Doctor Who is a British show. It's produced by the BBC. And it's very hard if you don't live in the UK to actually see those episodes. So they had contracts with with uh, uh, Netflix, I think, and then afterwards with uh, Amazon Prime. Um, and that was pretty recent that we were able to see these newer episodes of Doctor Who but, as you know, they now have a contract with Disney, and these new Doctor Who episodes for the 60th anniversary specials were the first ones that were basically available everywhere in the world where Disney Plus is doing business. And I've really been enjoying these three episodes, um, also because it featured the return of David Tennant as, this time, the 14th Doctor, and this third episode would feature the transition to the 15th the 15th Doctor. Um, and I was really... At one point I was like, this is too quickly. I want to hang out a little bit more with David Tennant. I don't want 
his doctor to be just featured in these three episodes. I want him to stick around a little bit longer. But I was also very curious about this this new doctor. And there is always this regeneration taking place. And uh, uh, this time, in this episode, they made it very special, and very memorable. Just to refresh your memory. This is going to stay spoiler-free, by the way. But just to refresh your memory, let me play the trailer for um, the, the episode called The Toy Maker. Sometimes I think there's something missing. Like I had something lovely. And it's gone. I lie in bed thinking. What have I lost? Then it is heading for Donna Noble. And I've got a memory. After a very long time, something's coming back. Who are they? Monsters. <laughs> There's something so bad the TARDIS ran away. Yes. Then we go and kick its ass! <laughs> All right, well, that shows that we're in for Jane a lot of action. Bridge Stewart. What do we do this time, Doctor? How do we fight the human race? Something entered this world. Oh, but he is recognizing me. Who is he? The one who waits. Open fire! Why does it have to be this? Your fight is with me! I don't know if I can save your life this time. This is such a great trailer, and of course, this uh, this particular trailer featured not just images from the third episode, but also the whole lead up with Donna Noble being back, brought back into the story, and then just all the all the excitement of new aliens invading, threatening the Earth, and the Doctor, of course, having to try to save us once again. And uh, in the in the final part of this trailer, you see this very mysterious figure that is called the toy maker and that harkens back to one of the earliest episodes of doctor who which was shot in black and white i think that uh only the last episode featuring the toy maker still exists the other two have been erased and are no longer available anywhere um they brought back that character in a new version and kind of like an upgraded version um the 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 initial toy maker was very um, inappropriate, to say the least. It, it, it was a white guy dressed up in Chinese clothes and it, uh, it lots of cultural appropriation and other stuff that wouldn't, wouldn't really fare well with our uh, kind of modern audiences. But they did keep um, that reference to the slightly racist character uh, because in, in this version of the toy maker, he uses all these fake accents. And at first, it's this very exaggerated German accent. And then after a while, he changes uh, to a French accent and then to a very American accent. And it's just switching all over the place. It's a lot of fun. Great acting. And um, the episode itself was not called the toy maker because they actually wanted to this not to um so confusion among people that know i think there is isn't there a marvel character that's also called the toy maker or something like that or the puppet puppet master I think it was like the puppet master anyway so they called this episode the giggle and you actually heard that giggle in this trailer. It was like, ha, 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 ha. And uh, the, 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 there's a very creepy backstory. I love the way this episode played out. It had so much action. And there were actually, one of the, one of the things that, that after seeing it, immediately after seeing it, um, we were talking about it on, on our Discord server with the other patrons. And um, uh, I said, the one thing that, that struck me and was kind of a little bit irking me was that, there, there seem to be like two or three story threads. It's just not one theme, but several themes. And I, it felt like this one episode was a bit overburdened. But now 
after a few days, I'm looking back at this episode and I'm thinking, no, actually, I do like it that there's so much crammed into this one episode because you, I was on the edge of my seat for the entire duration of the show. And I loved especially the last part where we see this transition from the 14th Doctor to the 15th Doctor. And I thought it was amazing. Um, this also sets things up for the Christmas special because... Thank goodness we do get another Doctor Who episode before the end of the year. And I just want to briefly uh, play the, the the Christmas trailer for this particular episode. Um, this is a very old tradition in Doctor Who um, a television production that, that almost, almost every year uh, at Christmas there is a special, almost like a standalone episode of Doctor Who, which is very much focused on Christmas and Christmassy themes and it's snowing and you've got all the cliches and at the same time there's always, it's, it's very classic Doctor Who. And so they do the same with uh, this new season of Doctor Who. It starts off actually with the new Doctor in this Christmas uh, episode, just like way back when, this is years ago, um, David Tennant's Doctor actually first um, was introduced to the general public in a Christmas episode. And just recently I was, I was looking around on the internet uh, and on YouTube um, for behind-the-scenes stuff. And let me recommend very quickly here that you follow the, the official Doctor Who channel on YouTube because they do such a fantastic job with so much extra footage and it's it's amazing i love all these extras and behind the scenes and you've got the commentary of the writers you've got the actors in all those uh, extra videos it's a lot of amazing content which normally you would only see on a blu-ray disc or something like that i don't think it's even featured on the disney plus channel you really have to go to youtube for that um and then some of the recommended videos were much older and, and one was particularly interesting it was a almost like a 45-minute video, which featured um, a video diary made by David Tennant during the first week or so, or two weeks, while he was shooting the Christmas episode, or his Christmas episode. And it was it's filmed, they gave him um, a DV camera, so really, um, at the time, that was... That was uh, um, let's say, expensive technology, like it was a small camera. Uh, nowadays, oh, the quality is so terrible and it's it's really bad in, la in, in low light. But the, the advantage is, and this was before you could film with your with your cell phone, um, he, he made a, a daily diary where oftentimes he's just filming himself after a day of shooting and he's, he's at home and he's like, oh, wow, well, uh, this happened and that happened. And it's incredibly kind of raw and, and authentic. And it's um, so fascinating to see the personal memories of an actor who's now so iconically tied to the Doctor Who franchise. But at the time, this was brand new for him. He had no idea what was in store for him. And it's, it's a lot of fun to see. And he even films um, the moment that he watches the episode at Christmas time with his parents and maybe siblings or at least some other people are in the room. And it's just, they're watching this on an old fashioned TV. Now we call that old fashioned, but it's like one of those early 16 by nine televisions, which weighed a ton. I think the diameter of the screen was like 16 inches. So it's a tiny little TV and he's sitting there watching it. And I always kind of imagine that actors are watching this in a in a theater, you know, w w with a fantastic audio system, and they, they watch it in the best quality available. No, instead, he's watching the premiere of his first Doctor Who episode on a tiny little TV in a room, and probably the audio is mono, and he... He never got to see it the way that we can experience it now that we're watching this on Blu-ray or on, uh, you know, on big screen TVs. It was incredible how much technology has evolved. But anyway, go check that out. Also, another tip before I play the audio of, of the Christmas trailer is uh, ch check out the official Doctor Who podcast because, yes, there is an official podcast. And uh, oftentimes, these television movie podcasts are 
just promotional th- um, episodes, not very interesting, but not with Doctor Who. It's so well produced. It's it's a, a group of Doctor Who fans, one of which I was already following on TikTok, and all of a sudden he's like, I know this voice. Oh, it's the guy from TikTok. And he's normally doing a, 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 a similar things that, that I like to do on, on TikTok and, and YouTube, commenting about deeper layers in, in movies and TV shows. He's been invited to host the Doctor Who podcast and it, it's a great discussion, and it's usually there right after the episode airs, so you've got this immediate feedback, or you, you have like a, a show you can go to right after seeing the episode, because they get to see the episodes a little bit earlier, and then they can pre-record this, uh, this show. So anyway, with, without further ado, let's play the Christmas trailer for the episode called The Church on Ruby Road. Merry Christmas. I'm the doctor. What's up there? Goblins. Oh yeah. Time travelers are great. Like wow. Ah! Hold on tight. Who are you? <laughs> the doctor, obviously. Doctor Who has never looked so click good. Below oh. to subscribe to the official Doctor Who YouTube channel. Okay, so that was a little plug at the end where you have to uh, to subscribe to the channel, which you probably already have done. But anyway, so um, the, the Doctor Who now really looks like a Marvel production. It's the special effects are amazing. This particular episode features a lot of goblins, and they look fantastic. I think it's all practical. Maybe enhanced with a few digital goblins, but it, this this could have been, you know, straight out of Weta Studios or something like well, I don't know, um, yeah, Marvel or even Star Wars. It is that good, and I'm I'm so excited that we get to see Doctor Who at this level of quality. It is really really cool. Anyway, so enough about Doctor Who. I'm really looking forward to the Christmas episode. And then I don't know how long we have to wait to see uh, the rest of the season, actually. Um, but I kind of hope that we have a little bit more time for to... I need to catch up on so many other shows that I've missed. Um, so I don't mind if we have to wait a little before we see the official uh, next Doctor Who season. The new Doctor makes an incredible impression. I I think he's amazing. So um, anyway, Uh, another thing that I always do around this time of the year is to watch um, Christmas movies. And well, if I say Christmas movie, you of course know that I'm talking about Die Hard. Um, This this is like going to Midnight Mass on on Christmas Eve. Um, Die Hard is part of uh, any decent geeky Christmas tradition. So Definitely that. And then, of course, you've got Home Alone. I really hoped to build the Home Alone Lego house this year, but unfortunately, it's still so expensive. And I I got so many other Lego sets. I'm going to be talking a bit more about my Lego project this year because I'm building a, a Lego town. Um, but I'll, I'll do that in a, a part of the show for, for my patrons. So uh, if you go to patreon.com slash Father Roderick, you sign up for any level, any tier of my patron uh, community, then you'll, you'll be able to download premium episodes of, uh, of this show. So anyway, I'll talk a bit more about Lego. But um, I, I always watch Home Alone. I actually did not see that movie when it first came out because I think I was in seminary. And so for about five years when I was studying in Belgium, I did not watch any TV I saw a few movies, thankfully. So the, I saw Back to the Future 2 in a movie theater. But that was about it. We didn't have t- a TV in the seminary. So I, I missed out on a lot of stuff that I'm now catching up. And so uh, now that Home Alone is available on, I think it's on Disney as well. Uh, I've been watching it multiple times and it's so much fun. It's really, really great fun. And uh, there are some other Christmas movies that get recommended to me uh, time and again. Um, some of which I actually like and others I never really gotten into. Like It's a Wonderful Life or Wonderful World. I think it's a Wonderful Life, right? Everybody tells me oh, it's the quintessential Christmas movie. And I every year I try to watch it. And every year after about 15 minutes, I'm thinking like, I'll watch it some other time. I just, 
I don't. I can't get into it. I don't know why. It's just not a very cheerful. Maybe I'm just too much of a superficial romantic Christmas lover. I just want to feel Christmassy, and it's a. It's a. It's actually a a, a difficult theme. The the. Uh, it's a wonderful life. But anyway, your mileage may vary, and I know that I've now enraged part of my audience. It's like, how can you say this? It's the best Christmas movie ever, and you have to watch it. Every year we have this discussion. I'll I'll do my best. I'll try it once again, but yeah, it's still not it's still not really on my on my on my list of of, of go to Christmas traditions. I am watching some other stuff. Um, oftentimes I I mine TikTok for ideas on what to watch, what to read, and so I saw um, a TikTok video from someone who recommended a eight episode television show on Netflix. Um, it's kind of a bit of a teen romance type of thing, but uh, the, the, the reviewer said it was fun. And um, and so I started watching that. It's called Dash and Lily. So it's on Netflix. It tells the story of um, a girl who loves Christmas and a boy who hates Christmas. And they actually don't get to meet in the first few episodes. Instead, they are communicating through a book or a diary. And so she writes a diary entry with some riddles. She places it in a bookstore where anyone can find it. And so the person she writes to, she doesn't know who's going to pick up the book, but there are clues in there. So you have to know, you have to be a book lover to know what she's talking about. And so you get this whole uh, like treasure hunt. And it all is filmed in New York, which is amazing. And I love it because Manhattan is such an amazing city. Uh, and especially around Christmas time, and uh, so it, it for me the one of the major reasons to watch this series is not really the story because that's yeah it's okay it's it's fun it's uh, a little bit too much geared towards a younger audience um, so uh, yeah it's not really my thing but it is beautifully done the photography is amazing and and it's it's just very Christmassy and it does remind me a lot of the Hawkeye uh, Marvel series which I also absolutely loved. Um, so with uh, what's his name Renner the actor who got into that accident um, after he was done shooting the the show thankfully he's recovering quite quite well but anyway Hawkeye was not really one of my favorite Marvel heroes I think for everyone he was a little bit like yeah he's part of the Avengers but he's not the Hulk he's not uh, Loki he's not Thor he's not um, uh, Black Widow so but he got his own television series which is also filmed in manhattan around christmas time i absolutely love it so um maybe i'll i'll, I'll re-watch that one just because i so much enjoyed that series last year what was it no two years ago already that was in the middle of COVID that that was aired crazy anyway um so uh yeah what else am i going to talk about well let's move over to italy here <music> Because I actually am going to Italy in a few days from now. I'm recording this on Wednesday, and this Saturday I'm heading for Rome. I had a little bit of spare time with no uh, appointments in my calendar, and I realized, well, wait a minute, I can actually go for a trip to one of my favorite places on the world. And so uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend uh, the entire week leading up to Christmas in Rome. And Rome is beautiful around Christmas time. You may have seen the videos of my friend Mountain uh, Butorek on, on, on Instagram. And he also, I think he also posts, cross posts them on, on Facebook. But Mountain is a... <clears throat> Uh, uh, someone who organizes pilgrimages in Rome. He lives in Rome with his family, and uh, and and he films almost daily uh, footage of of what's happening around the Vatican. And he, so he made a video of the unveiling of the, the, the this year's nativity scene uh, in the center. It's around. It's built around the obelisk in the center of of Saint Peter's Square, and um, and also the the moment that they lit up the the, the Christmas tree, uh, and that, and that was a very un 
un un European moment because the the for for a couple of years now it, it, when I was in studying in Rome the Christmas tree was just that was just a big tree with lights in it and but it you know it's just that nowadays they have these the computerized LED lights and it's this whole like firework show it's it's insane it feels like something straight out of Disneyland and so they had this moment where they light up the tree and it's got all this this movement with the lights and I'm, I'm thinking. It, it just feels so American. So I don't know. I mean, but people love it. And I have to say, Italians do like their Christmas lights. If you walk around in Trastevere, for instance, it's like every restaurant, every bar is, is decorated with tons and tons of tiny LED lights. It's one of the things I'm looking forward to is just to, to be in Rome and, and to, to just experience that Christmas atmosphere i i live in a village here in the netherlands which is predominantly protestant um there is a catholic church obviously because i live in the former rectory of that church but most of the population used to be um kind of more of the 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 strict observant protestant type so this village is just not feeling very Christmassy. there are some lights now and they did have a dickens fair the other day which was fun um but around Christmas time, I always like, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm more used to more Catholic environment around Christmas time, so I'm I'm super happy that I'll be spending uh, up until the 23rd actually. So right, the day before Christmas Eve, I'll be in Rome, and and uh, Rome is is all about Christmas right now. So every church already has nativity scenes, and and obviously, if you follow me on social media or if you're a patron, um, you may want to. Keep an eye on my my travel logs because I'll be probably posting a lot of uh, of images. So anyway, so that's going to be a lot of fun this next week. One thing that I want to try out is um, uh, Apple just updated the uh, iOS of, on on the phones with iOS. I think it was seventeen point two, which now has enabled three D filming. Now this is only available on the. Uh, iPhone 15 Max and Max Pro, and I've got the Max Pro, and so it uses the two cameras. So you've got three cameras on the on the Pro uh, models, and uh, one is the like the regular camera, the other one is the wide angle camera, and they are actually on the same level. And so what Apple did is to create um, a, an app that can use both these cameras at the same time to film a three dimensional image and that is in preparation of the of the vision pro the 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 first ar vr goggle goggles that will be introduced next next year and what i love is that they've already made it possible for people to record in 3d even though it will take probably a couple a couple of years before um the vision the apple vision pro becomes remotely something you know that 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 remotely gets close to uh, what Meta is doing with the Oculus Quest. However, if it's recorded, it can be decoded. There are already apps that can uh, transform this into formats that will work on, for instance, on 3D televisions, maybe even on the on the Meta so, uh, on the Meta Quest. So, what I want to do is, since I will be in Rome and since it's going to be very beautiful there, I am going to record in 3D. I'm going to do a lot of footage in 3D, and um, just in case. So, because I love 3D, and at one point, I'm pretty sure that we'll have an, an Apple Vision, whatever. I don't know if it's going to be the Pro, because I, I will, <laughs> the price needs to go down at least, I don't know, 80% before I'm, I'm, I'm interested. But at one point, this being Apple, I'm sure that they have a they already have an idea of, of, of when this will become a mainstream device. And, well, content is king. So, if I start to film in 3D now, I'll be able to, uh, to, to take advantage of that, uh, you know, having a little bit of an ad advance, how you say that, production um, workflow for, for this material. So that's, that's going to be one of the things that, I, uh, that I'll, I'll be doing. Anyway, why do I talk about this? Um, I'm also going to be in, uh, in Rome for the food. And I love going to these small restaurants and try out new ones and discover new recipes. And I know that Italian food, especially food 
that you get in, for instance, in Trastevere, right? it's all, um, it's, it's usually only has a few ingredients, and but the quality of the ingredients is what is important. And, and oftentimes, when I discover a new dish, I'm going to hunt for the recipe. And so you may remember if you're an old, an older listener, well, someone who's been listening for, for a long time doesn't mean you're old. Um, but uh, you may remember that I, uh, me talking about Pasta Califa. And there's only one restaurant in Rome where you can order that. And it's uh, La Vittoria. It's uh, on the left of the Vatican. Um, and I, I remember ordering that once just because I had already tried all their other pasta. And I was like, Khalifa, that sounds exotic. Let me try that. And it was so good. And for years, I've been trying to reproduce that recipe. And I knew it had to be simple, but I just couldn't figure it out. And I finally discovered the recipe. And then I lost it again. This this past summer, I wanted to uh, make pasta Khalifa for uh, the other three priests. And I, I couldn't remember the recipe. And I also could not remember where I stored it. So usually OneNote is where I leave all my recipes, but I couldn't find it there. Um, I didn't have my computer with me, so I couldn't do a search. And Anyway, I finally found that recipe again. And tonight, actually, after I'm done recording this show, I'm going to make that pasta califa just to whet my appetite for the time that I'll be in Rome. Now, speaking of pasta, did you know, actually, what to look for when you buy pasta? You think, well, pasta is pasta, you know, spaghetti and tagliatelle, etc. But there is actually something that distinguishes, and it's a visible thing that helps you distinguish good quality pasta from, let's say, more run-of-the-mill, cheap pasta. And I found a video on TikTok that explains it really well. Um, it's Francesco Matana, and he's got a TikTok channel called Our, Our Cooking Journey. Let me, I'll, I'll let him explain what to look for. So many of you ask me, Francesco, what is a good quality pasta brand? I can't really give you a particular type of brand, but I can help you choose the best quality pasta that you can find in any supermarket. Here I have two okay, type of pennette, and they both use the same exact ingredient. Durum with semolina and water. A good pasta must have a light yellow color, this almost ivory. This means the pasta has been dry slowly at low temperature, and all of the nutrients, they haven't been burned. When you so Again, what he's saying is you have to look at the color of the pasta. Now, I always thought that the more yellow the pasta was, the, the better it tasted. Actually, he says it's the opposite. You have to look for almost like an ivory color. It has to be almost a bit white. And that has to do with the drying process. So the cheaper the pasta, the faster it is dried because money, right? And so the longer pasta has the time to, to dry, the tastier it gets, it's probably just chemistry. And it also creates a different texture on the surface of the pasta, which, as you may know, is super important for the combination with the sauce. You want the pasta not to be completely um, like plasticky. No, it, like the, the, the rougher the surface of the pasta, the, the better the, the sauce will cling to the pasta, will coat the pasta. When you find yourself in front of this, a shelf of bright yellow color pasta, well, that's not a good sign. This means the pasta has been put through a violent drying process, which means a very high temperature for a very short amount of time. The surface of the pasta should be rough and opaque, which is created by the extrusion technique. So if you want to level up your pasta dishes, then look for trafilatura al bronzo, or bronze drawn extruded. This will Trafilatura... I need to look that up. <laughs> Bronza? Help you to create a nice creamy sauce. The last and not least is the cooking process. When a pasta is made with very good quality durum with semolina, it will hold the shape and it will not go mushy. I hope that now you have a little bit more knowledge to choose the best pasta you can find. I had no idea, but I really need to look for that. And I actually do have a, one of those brands, um, but I don't have the, the tagliatelle. I know that my local supermarket here next door actually sells that higher quality pasta as well. Um, and for the pasta califa recipe, uh, you actually need the, the, the curly pasta. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a look uh, when I'm done podcasting to see if I can, uh, can get that. Because of course, you know, it's 
Yeah, it's a bit more expensive. But then I'm thinking of what would I pay in Rome for a dish like that? It would be like five times the amount of money. So why do I always um, go for the lowest quality ingredients just because just to save a buck or something? Uh, like no, if 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 I make if I cook Italian pasta, I need to go for quality ingredients because that is what makes Italian food so good. It's not the amount of ingredients. It's not because it's a very complicated way of cooking. No, it's the quality of the individual um, uh, ingredients. And you don't need many ingredients as long as they're a good quality to make a good dish. When did you become an expert in thermonuclear astrophysics? Last night. The packet. The extraction theory papers. Am I the only one who did the reading? All right, let's talk about a reading, and I'm finally done. This last book took me so long. Um, I'm finally done reading the third book of the trilogy of the Red Rising saga by Piers Brown. Now, Piers Brown has been writing these books since, I don't know. Well, they've been out there for about 10, 15 years. So I'm very behind. I'd never really um, knew about these books until recently. And so I've been reading the first three books. And this is a fantastic story. I've, I've, I've mentioned it several times before here on the show. Um, but it may also be that that sometimes I, I, I talked about the books in the, in the premium version for the patrons. So not everyone who's listening to this particular public show. Um, has heard me talk about that. So Red Rising, very briefly, what is it about? It's a future story. Um, people live on Mars, and uh, 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 the, the, the hero of the story, Darrow, lives underground. He works in the mines because they think that the surface of Mars has not been colonized yet, has not been terraformed. The fact is, they are kept in the dark, literally, by an upper-class, elite part of the society that lives above ground. And Mars, you know, is, is perfectly fine. You can breathe. The, the, the only thing that makes it different from Earth is that the gravity is, is lower. And the moment uh, Darrow discovers that, he goes on a quest to, to free his people. So it's a bit of a Moses story also. So he, he uh, mingles with the these these genetically modified super you know uber mention that live on the surface of the planet, and he plays their war games to get the upper hand. And at one point, uh, he becomes so powerful that he may or may not be able to do what he intended to do, and that is to become the the liberator of his people, of the other Reds that live underground. And um, the second book was uh, definitely a step up from the first book. It was uh, very high-octane action. The, the Pierce Brown is a very good action writer. So uh, it, it's this is a pretty violent story. It's a, there are a lot of wars, there's a lot of fighting, but at the same time, there are lots and lots of moments where the characters have to make moral choices. And it's always about um, this this delicate balance between having to act and sometimes use violence for the greater good for the for the liberation of people but at the same time to not lose track of your own values and of the value of human life etc etc so there are always these difficult situations where uh, okay do we kill or do we spare someone? And if we are too violent, maybe maybe we become like the enemy that we're actually fighting. So there's a lot of that going on in the books, which which make them, uh, I think, more interesting than just a story about wars in the future. And uh, and then the third book, um, which is called Morning Star, is the uh, 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 the like the conclusion of this of this liberation war. And uh, one of the things that uh, really kept me reading is that the, the, the books are so full of twists. Every time you think that something is done and then something happens and it, oh my gosh, I didn't think of that. And then uh, there's a new conflict, there's a new crisis that has to be solved. And there are lots and lots of these twists and turns um, that are very well placed. This, the book never gets boring. Some other books, like the Mistborn series that I've read uh, also this year, um, similar books in, in tone and also in length. These are pretty long books to read. Um, but in the Mistborn saga, I really love the story. I love the world building, but there are also lots and lots of chapters where it feels like the story is just losing its speed and it's like its momentum. It all usually 
you know, speeds up towards the end of the book. So there's always a satisfying conclusion. But there are also parts of the book where I couldn't wait for Brandon Sanderson to just just move along, you know, it's, it's just so, and the same thing with the Wheel of Time, Wheel of Time has some fantastic moments, but they're also just, there's so much, so many pages where it just, just prods along, and it's not very interesting, well, this is why I like Red Rising, the Red Rising saga, it's non-stop action, there's not a single dull moment in any of these three books, which is very rare, um, and it's also a very satisfying conclusion to this first trilogy. Now, I, I, I understand that there are three more books. So the story actually, even though it does wrap up, it's like a season finale, the third book. And, but the story continues. So, but I need a break. After, I think every book is like five, 600 pages. And these books did slow me down. Uh, you may know that I have this uh, uh, Goodreads reading challenge where I, I challenged myself to read 150 books this year. And uh, for most of the year, I've been doing really well. But because this, these, two, these three books were so vast, so, so big, it slowed me down tremendously. Now I'm eight books behind. It basically comes down to the situation where I have 17 more days in until the end of the year, and I've got 17 books to read. So it means I have to read one book per day. I'm not going to read 600-page books anymore this year. <laughs> but I did enjoy, I, I, I am glad that I gave myself the opportunity to read bigger books because um, every once in a while, I just want to plunge into a world. And it, it's, it's not really about the amount of books, of course. It's about the quality of the experience. Now, I did set myself that goal because I want to give myself uh, uh, like an impetus to to keep reading and I'm I'm glad I did because I I I read so many different books, not all fiction, also a lot of more scientific books. And um, I, I learned a lot about biblical scholarship and kind of caught up uh, what I missed out on after I became a priest and just didn't have time to study anymore. So I, I, I don't regret having set myself that goal but I also am glad that, that I was able to read a, a couple of really big books that, yeah, did slow me down, but it was worth it. So for next year, I'm thinking of maybe going back to 100 books per year um, so that I give myself more time for bigger books. I do want to read more of the Wheel of Time uh, saga. And also, I really want to read these next three books in the Red Rising saga. And with that, we've come to the end of my public show. Uh, doesn't mean that's entirely the end, because my patrons know that in the premium version of the show, we're going to talk about other stuff. Um, I'll, I'll be talking a bit more about my upcoming trip to Rome and my plans there. I also want to share some tips about um, how to clean your inbox in 10 minutes. Like, it's, it sounds magical, but it is actually possible. So even if you have hundreds of emails in your inbox, it's possible to get rid of all of them and to only keep what is important in within 10 to 30 minutes. Anyway, so loved that tip. I'm definitely going to try that out. Um, and also, I'll uh, talk a bit more, as I mentioned before, uh, about my Christmas town and... I actually created a Snowden TARDIS, and it looks amazing, and I, I came up with this little Doctor Who Christmas story, so I'll share more of that, but in case you're not a patron, or you're not able to, uh, to join the Patreon community right now, um, you can also take a look at my YouTube channel about Lego, which is youtube.com slash brickpriest. I think it's Brick Priest. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll um, post a video about the Doctor Who, the Snowden Tardis and, and the Christmas Doctor Who story. All that and more coming up for my patrons. And we'll talk next week. And I'll probably be podcasting from Rome. All right. That was the... First part of the show, um, I think that was about 40 minutes, so I, I still have 20 minutes to go. Let's, let's move on. What's the next jingle? Oh, yeah, it's the trips.
These are actually the wrong sounds for this segment, uh, where I talk about travels. This this evokes springtime. Uh, maybe the Shire, maybe New Zealand, but alas, this year I'm not going to New Zealand. It is still on my on my to travel list. I really want to go back to uh, to New Zealand and visit um, the Mata Mata set, and uh, you know catch up with my friends there. But uh, I don't think it's going to happen this year. Maybe next year. Um, I do have some some travel plans for the next couple of months. Obviously, the first one is uh, what I uh, what I mentioned earlier here in the show, and that's my upcoming trip to Rome. Um, I've been in Rome once before in the Christmas season. However, it was past Christmas. Now, of course, I was in Rome because I, I lived there for two years. So I've been in Rome <laughs> twice for Christmas time, and I have fond memories of that. This was when Pope John Paul II was still alive, and I remember twice witnessing the the, the 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 unveiling of the of the nativity scene and then the big tree on St. Peter's Square. We even after a repetition, a choir repetition in the Dutch church close to the Vatican, we went to the obelisk and we sang Christmas songs and uh the the square was empty. So we had this amazing acoustic effect where our our, our Christmas song. We had a full choir there, um, and and the entire it filled the the square. And we we were looking at the window of uh, the papal apartment, which of course now is in Santa Santa Marta. But at the time, in in the time of of, of uh, John Paul II, that was still in the big building on the right side of the square. And we saw that the the light was on. So Pope Pope John Paul II was sitting there, or I don't know, maybe he was meeting people, but he would probably be able to hear our songs. It was, this is just a very fond memory that I had during the time that I lived in Rome at Christmas time. I, I came back to Rome once once uh, more in during the Christmas season, and this was already, I think, five or six years ago. I, I went there to film um, a television episode. I stayed at a cheap hotel, um, and it was, I think, in the first or the second week of, of January, which is usually a time where all the tourists are gone. And so I was able to get a very nice hotel room for, for a bargain price. And I, I still remember that when uh, th- it was including breakfast and, and there was this breakfast room and there were these big windows. And from the table, from my breakfast table, I could see St. Peter's Square and the Basilica. It was amazing. Um, I, I, I tried to look up the hotel, and around this time of the year, it is way beyond my budget. It's hundreds of euros per night, but um, it, it was worth it at the time. And the funny thing is, here in the Netherlands, once Christmas is over, like it's immediately everybody's done with Christmas. No more Christmas music. Everybody takes the lights down, and it's, it's as if Christmas never happened. I, I don't understand why this is. Because for Catholics, of course, Christmas is the beginning of the Christmas season. Whereas in, 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 for, for a lot of people that are not <clears throat> Catholic, Christmas starts, well, it has already started, right? But for us, the Christmas morning is the start of the Christmas season, and it goes on for a couple of weeks. I mean, we, we still have the... the, the um, Oh, oh, the the feast of the Holy Family and um, gosh the uh, thinking of the the official name well anyway the the, the, the feast of the the Magi um, and uh, what else is there when does it start? I think the baptism of the Lord is the official end of the Christmas season anyway so um, in January Rome is still completely covered in Christmas lights. All the Christmas trees are there. Uh, every church still has the nativity scene up. It's amazing. It, it feels like it's still Christmas. And that's, I think, what it should be. But uh, in the Netherlands, the Christmas was already over. So, uh, But now I'll be in, in Rome before Christmas, which I think I'm going to like even more. It's this whole anticipation, like Christmas is coming, and it's visually it's almost there. So anyway, um, some other... Um, the, the reason that I actually uh, booked this trip is that I realized that if I don't travel in this time of my life, um, there will be a moment later in my life where I will regret not having traveled. 
uh, I know how much travels have given me stories to tell, how much it expanded my horizon, how much I've learned from my travels. And during COVID, it's the thing that I miss the most is, is to be able to go out, you know, to go on a trip, to go to a different country. Thankfully, I was able to go on vacation, but that was just once uh, in, in a year, and, and and it was in the summertime, of course, the pandemic was less dangerous. But um, after COVID, I never really picked up the pace anymore. And I, I really want to travel more this upcoming year. Um, and there are a few areas, of, a few regions in the world that I haven't discovered yet and I want to go to. There is um, Eastern Europe. I, I want to go to Prague. I've never been to Prague. I want to go to Barcelona in, in Spain. Uh, I love Spain. And everybody tells me you have to go to Barcelona because it's a beautiful city. Never been there. It's it's not very hard to get there. Um, I also really want to go back to London. Th that was the, the, the trip this year that brought back this, this love of traveling. Um, I've gushed about how much I love uh, London. I just, for me, it's... It's like Rome. It's the same feeling. When I'm in London, I feel like, oh, I never want to leave. And I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I want to go back, and I want to go back in the in the springtime. Um, of course, there is a risk of rain, <laughs> this being the UK. But I did not want to go to, to London in around this time of the year because it's, A, expensive. B, it's very busy in my life right now. C, the weather is lousy in London. So I'm going to wait until the maybe in some around May or June, early June. That that I think is a is a safe time to go to London. So I'm already going to make some plans for that. I actually am considering maybe also walking part of the Camino this upcoming year. It's been five years since I walked it. It has been a life transforming, life changing experience. And for years, it, I just didn't feel comfortable with the idea of walking the Camino because of COVID. Um, and also because at, right after the pandemic was more or less, well, it's not over, but it's, it's not, not as dangerous as it used to be. Uh, especially the, um, the itinerary that I walked, the first time I walked to Santiago, um, became overcrowded. It's like it's a massive traffic uh, congestion and it's not fun anymore. So I'm thinking maybe I'll, I'll walk a shorter itinerary um, in, in maybe in April. I loved walking the Camino in April because it's not very warm in Spain and it's not as crowded. So I'm thinking there are two options. Either I can, I can um, walk the itinerary going from Lisbon or maybe Porto. And so to walk it from... Uh, a place in Portugal to Santiago. That's one option. The one that I actually really uh, would like to walk is uh, the one that goes. It's the. It's a very old itinerary that is more following a northern route. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see. The only the only thing I'm a bit wary about uh, is um, are my feet going to be okay because I uh, have had these these. The trouble with my with with walking i have special souls right now um but it's not entirely over i still get very tired feet after a couple of hours and of course if i walk the camino that means six seven eight hours of walking every single day so i i'm, I'm not sure if i will be able to physically but i know that if i want to walk the camino i need to walk it soon because I'm now at an age in my life where I can still travel a lot and, and discover these places. But 10 years from now, I'll be even older than I am right now. So I don't know what my physical condition will be. It's, this is a, like a general um, call, I would say, to action for, for all of you who are listening to this. Make sure to use the time that you've been given. Don't think of the future as just being this wide open, massive collection of opportunities no, you are actually a human being. So you are getting older. Your body is um, is also using uh, itself. And, and so after uh, there will be a, a time in your life that you won't be able to do the things that you can do now. So take advantage of each phase in your life. There will be other things that will replace traveling, etc. Every, every age has its graces. But 
Don't miss out on important things, on experiences. They are more important than making money and working all the time. Now, of course, you have to work to be able to pay for, for traveling, but, but make sure you have a good balance. Don't think, well, I'll do that when, I, when I'm older or when I retire because, you know, as a pastor, I've been, I've been accompanying so many people that thought the same. It's like, once I'm retired, I'll go travel. I'll go do this and I'll go do that. And then they retire and they get sick and they die. That, it happens. I mean, it sounds a bit dark, but it's the reality. You never know how much time you've been given. So make sure that you follow the opportunities to gather experiences rather than, than, than following a career. Or I mean, it's good to have goals, but don't spend your life just working because work is there to help you live. <sighs> work to live, not live to work. That would be my basic message to you. So anyway, I'm going to make sure that I lead by example. And so the Camino, Rome, Scotland, it's all on my list. And maybe Prague, maybe Barcelona. Um, and of course... Uh, you can follow me on those trips uh, just by, by following me. <laughs> All right, here is uh, my favorite segment of the show, and that is to share with you the things I've learned on the internet. And as I teased already before uh, to the people that are listening to the public show, I always cut out that last conclusion. Um, so it's basically the same ending music that I play here on, on, the, uh, on the premium show. Um, but I, I tease what's in the premium show. So the public listeners already know this, but I would like to talk about a, a fantastic tip that I just saw this day about how to clean your inbox. This is one of the things that I that I love to do at the end of the year. This is why between Christmas and New Year, New Year's Eve, I don't want to plan too many uh, appointments because I need that time to to put an end to the <laughs> to to wrap up the year by cleaning stuff. So what I what I want to do this year is to clean my hard drive, archive every stuff, everything that's on there that I won't need next year. So to offload it off my main hard drive, put it on archival disks. That's something that if I do that every year, it is containable. I haven't done that in the past. And so the, earlier this year, I spent weeks cleaning and organizing my hard drives. I also want to do the same with my phone. The iPhone uh, 15 um, has limited storage capacity. And over time, you do take a lot of pictures and, and, and video footage, but at one point, it's going to be full, so I want to offload that. Maybe I'll do that even before I go to Rome, so I have maximum space on the phone to 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 register my experiences in 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 the Eternal City. Um, but I also want to clean out my inbox, and this is also a a very daunting uh, job. I I I I always fear going into my inbox because it's the moment that uh, you know that I suffer from ADHD symptoms. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that I am convinced that I have ADHD is that um, I, I follow classic patterns that I read about in books that I hear from other people with ADHD. And one of these things is if you're overwhelmed, you, we tend to procrastinate or we tend to push something completely out of our mind. Like I often get, people emailing me with questions like, could you please speak at this or this event? Or could you do... And sometimes I'm in a good mood, I have energy, and I answer right away. But there are also times that I receive a message like that at the end of the day, and I'm overwhelmed. I'm like overstimulated. I've had so much going on in my life. And I, I see that email, and immediately there's like this sense of panic, like, oh, I can't deal with this now. And so, and then I push it away, and I forget about it. I completely blank out on the email and on the request which for someone who's neurotypical may, may feel very rude. Like, why don't you answer my emails? And sometimes the people send me a follow-up email and that makes the anxiety even bigger. So I also, I also ghost that, that request. So like, I don't answer with it. And, and the, at the end of the year, when I go through my email, I have to confront all these outstanding requests. And um, it always makes me realize 
how how much I've been procrastinating on on stuff and how much I've been ignoring people that actually wanted to hear from me. This year, I'm a little bit more lenient towards myself because I finally know that it's part of the way my brain is wired. So it's not because I I'm an evil person or because I I'm rude or anything. No, it's nothing like like sometimes I'm just overwhelmed and unfortunately I'm hyper accessible. People can call my phone, people can leave voice messages, people can page me on so many different social platforms. And the only way in which my brain can handle uh, like overload is by shutting it out. Um, and so this is also why a full inbox with hundreds and hundreds of emails, like I have a, every year at the end of the year, is also a source of stress. Because there's always this little red light in the back of my mind that tells me like, um, you should get back to that person. And you haven't. So I saw this video and it was so obvious and so simple. So it comes down, and I, can, I can summarize it in one minute, which makes it a really good educational video. Because I can, I can teach you now. So here's the deal. Stop with putting stuff in folders. Because it's a waste of time. It takes a lot of time. I have, unfortunately, um, many, many folders. And I have set up a ton of rules so that every email that comes in goes to this or that folder. So every, every time someone, of, you know, is parish related, emails me. It goes into certain church folders, so I'm I don't see that email in my inbox anymore. Um, but uh, I, a newsletter, same thing. I've I'm subscribed to a ton of newsletters, but I make sure that they all get pre-sorted into the newsletter folder. The thing is, if they go into a folder, my ADHD brain totally forgets about it, so I never check those folders. So it's it's a dangerous method. It also, uh, even though I do set up these rules, I have all these folders. Um, there are lots of emails that I still have to manually move to folders. And it's just extra time because there are only two types of emails. One, the first type, and that's the majority of the emails that we get, is just information. It's just stuff that people want us to know. And then a small fraction of all the email that is our current inbox is actionable. That's the second category. It means it's a message from someone that we need to follow up on. It's something that we need to do. It may be an alert from our tax person that we we, we need to do something financial or it, uh, uh, it's a, a warning that our password has changed or something like that. So we need to follow up on those. The problem is they get drowned in all these other emails that are just you know, it's just stuff. It's just information. It's not actionable. It's not a problem if I, I mean, I want to read it, but then I can forget about it. So how do you make sure that the things that are actionable stay in front of mind? The trick is simple. Stop with the folders. And then what you do on a regular basis, doesn't have to be every day, it can be, it can also be every week or maybe every month, depending on how much email you get, is you go through the stuff in your inbox. So the fact that you don't want folders is that there may be ticking time bombs hidden in those folders. But there's also, there are two categories of stuff in those folders. So it's very hard to keep track of all these important things. It's like the, the only thing you know is that what is actionable should stay on in front of mind. It should stay in the on top of your inbox. All the rest can go. But there may be stuff in there that you may want to refer to in the future. You may want to have that information available to you. So the thing is, you don't throw away emails, except for maybe newsletters, but you can also unsubscribe. Um, but you just archive. But If you have Gmail or Outlook, most of these um, email services give you a ton of space to store your emails. It's just text, so it doesn't take up much room anyway. You just archive. But the thing is, you go through your inbox, and that's the, basically the only place. You have inbox and you have your archive. Those are the only two places in your email. And then you go through that long list of emails and you just click on the emails. And it depends on what system you use. If Gmail and Outlook have slightly different things. But it's possible to say, well, these are actionable emails. And you make sure that those are marked. And then what you do is once you've done that, you, you, you group all those actionable emails, the ones that you want to keep, and you, uh, you tell your email program to snooze them. So what snoozing does, 
and this is relatively new, a couple of years ago, this functionality usually didn't exist. If you say, I want these emails to be snoozed, they disappear from your inbox as if they haven't been sent. And then you can set a time for when they return into your inbox. So for instance, you say, well, I, I snooze them for 10 minutes. And then so all these actionable emails, the ones that you know you have to stay on top of, they disappear from your inbox. And then what you do is you select all the other ones and you archive them. And so they disappear. And then 10 minutes later, all the actionable emails come back into your inbox. It's like, hey, we're back, we're back. Please help us. And that's what you do. Your, so your inbox only has actionable emails and you go through them one by one and you make sure that they don't stay in your email, in your inbox. You, you, whatever is actionable, you do it or you put it in, for instance, on your calendar or whatever, your to-do list. They don't stay in your inbox. Your inbox is not a to-do list. And then the moment that you took it out of your email, you archive it. And so it disappears. And this is a very fast way to get to inbox zero in well, between 10 minutes and an hour. So that's what I'm planning to do. And that's what I wanted to share with you. All right, let's talk about technology. We are on the cutting edge of technology. Wow. Well, what does that mean? Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device. And it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner built... Whoa. Better. Well... All your technology stuff, it just ends in disaster. But there is one more thing. All right, a few more digitally related topics here at the end of the show. Uh, first of all, Baldur's Gate 3 is finally available on the Xbox, and it was a covert launch. Um, the game got uh, chosen to be the game of the year, and from anyone who has played it, I've heard it's very much deserved. It is a fantastic game. I've been holding out on the game because I... It's like a typical game that I want to play in a relaxed mode. So if I'm sitting at my desk, um, it, that's my work attitude. But I, I tend to play video games after I'm done working, so I don't want to be at my desk. So I wanted this on my Xbox, but it was unavailable. It was already available for the PlayStation, but not for the Xbox. And so when, when they did their presentation on stage to accept the nomination or the, the, the prize of the game of the year... They, they planned on announcing it, and they forgot because they only got 30 seconds, which is outrageous. And so that same evening, I saw all of a sudden uh, messages appearing like, oh, it launched on the Xbox, and it's already available. So I looked around for a good deal, found a very good deal, and I now have access to Baldur's Gate 3. Now, it is time for you to join the others and complete our destiny! Just wait till you see Baldur's Gate. You'll never want to leave. A lot of people that have played this game already say it's not just the game of the year, it's the game of the decade. And so it's party time, the trailer says, and that's how it feels like. I'm so happy that I can now finally play it. And this is the, the one game that is on top of my to-do list for the week between Christmas and New Year's Eve. I'm going to immerse myself in Baldur's Gate. I've done, this is an old, another old tradition, end of the year tradition, where in the last week, next to, of course, reading a lot of books because I'm behind on my Goodreads uh, list, I, I love to have a number of days where I can just play video games. And, and usually there's this one game that I choose to, to immerse myself in and I make good progress because otherwise my gaming uh, time is very fragmented. But this is a game I think that deserves some extended time to play. So anyway, that's uh, Baldur's Gate 3. There is also um, a new app on of iPhones. Now I know that uh, some of you may not have access to uh, iOS devices. Um, 
Uh, but I was very excited uh, being someone who was actually agnostic when it comes to all these operating systems. I do have one of my phones is Android. And the other phone, like my business phone is Android. My 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 private phone is is iOS. Um, I I was very curious to see the journal app that was shown at the WWDC earlier this year, and it finally came out in this new update of the operating system. And it's unfortunately only available on the iPhone, whereas you know, it's a journaling app. So I need to be able to type. I hate, hate, hate typing on my phone. Uh, but it's unfortunately not available yet on the Mac or on the iPad. And my iPad is the, is the machine that I use all the time as a, as a laptop. I have one of those uh, covers with, with a keyboard. Um, but anyway, I did start to use it. And it's really good. It gives you a lot of ideas and prompts. Um, and what is so cool is, of course, because this is part of the ecosystem of Apple, it does show you, for instance, photos that you took, or it ties into Apple Health. And it's, uh, it, 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 so I, I did an entry for today, and earlier today I went for a walk. So it shows me a map and, and a walk. And I can say, hey, I want to write about what I did during that walk. So I wrote a little entry, like I went for a half-hour walk and uh, at the same time I was thinking about uh, my coaching initiative next year. So uh, in a nutshell, listen to the walk if you want to hear more about that. But I'm thinking of starting to, um, uh, like, a one, like a new initiative where I make myself available um, for parishes to help them with their social media efforts. I basically want to pass on what I've been practicing for over 15 years now and help other people that want, like me, to connect to the, the world outside of their own church uh, boundaries um, and to use social media for that. So anyway, I had some very uh, cool ideas during that walk, so I wrote them in my diary. Um, and uh, but I also had um, like uh, there was a delivery of two stainless steel pans that I bought. Well, I have um, uh, cast iron pans. The problem is you can't really make like tomato sauces in there because the the tomato there's acidity in the sauce that 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 um, attacks the um, the steel. Um, so I got stainless steel pans for pasta dishes. So these are the pans that I see in in Italian restaurants all the time. So I took a picture of those pans and I, I, I started the journal and there was the picture. And it was like, do you want to write something? And I was like, yeah, that is so cool. Hey, I got these two pans. And so now next year I can go back to this date and I can see, oh, that's when the pans arrived. And yeah, it's just, it, it's, I love the fact that it's pre-populated. It also um, has an API so other apps can up, update their software so that, for instance, in the future when I listen to a podcast, uh, it already does it now for the podcasting app, the Apple Podcast app, but I use uh, Pocket Casts. But Pocket Casts in the future can tap into the API so that when I open my journal, I can see, hey, today I listened to this or this episode, and maybe there's something in that episode that I want to remember. So I make a note in my diary. Th strangely enough, the diary is not, or the journal is not searchable. And that is obviously like a, a functionality you want to have because I want to be able to use this diary uh, for, for future use so that I, I can use it also to jot down my ideas. I use OneNote for that. But OneNote is it's, uh, it's also just very messy. Like with that recipe for Pasta Khalifa, I, I put it somewhere in, in OneNote and I couldn't find it anymore. So this is where I hope that, that Apple will keep working on the journal app. And please, please, please make it available on the Mac as well and on the iPad as well because the only way I can write those journal entries now is by dictating them. Because I, I don't know what it is, but the autocorrect is horrible on iOS. In fact, I installed the, the, the what is it, a keystroke uh, app from Google because that's the one I use on, on Android and it's so much better than Apple's uh, uh, keyboard but anyway anyway give me a possibility to use this app with a keyboard uh, what else um, for those of you that would like to try out Mastodon but you've been holding back because it's so complicated um, I still really really love Mastodon as an initiative and there are 15 million people on there so there's a lot of content um, and with Twitter still going you know, still still in decline, and there's just the craziness of that place. 
I think Mastodon is um, is one of one of the most promising platforms right now. I know there's Blue Sky, but Blue Sky is also proprietary. I, I don't know about Blue Sky. It I I have it. I'm active on Blue Sky, but it doesn't it doesn't work. It doesn't have the same feel as Twitter to me. Um, and then I'm uh, also really looking forward to tomorrow at noon because that's when threads will be available in europe as well they finally caved and uh um, are, are now willing to obey to the the european rules about data privacy um and they, they needed some time so that is absolutely a platform where i will be active um because it's tied to instagram i'm already on threats by the way if you are on threats and you want to follow me just look for father roderick but if you want an easy entrance into the Macedon universe and you thought the whole onboarding process was complicated, check out Mammoth. Mammoth on iOS. It's available. You could also use it on the Mac um, as an app, as a mobile app. Um, and it's, it's really good. What I love about M Mammoth as a Mastodon client is it solves a problem that a lot of Mastodon users had. They go to Mastodon. And they think that it's like Twitter, but you cannot search for text. You can do a search for hashtags, but you have to know that. So for a lot of people, it's like, this is an empty place. I don't know who to follow. I don't see my friends here. And what, what Mammoth does, it, 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 it does a query before you, during the onboarding process. And it's, like, it's a bit like what Pinterest does. Yeah, so what do you like to read about? Technology, science, politics arts etc and then it has these curated lists by real people so it's not an algorithm and so the moment you subscribe to a certain area of interest you get a, a lot of people that you're all of a sudden following that update regularly quality content and so in a, in a few minutes your mastodon environment all of a sudden is full of interesting content i think it's genius and it's it's one of those one of those things that I wish they had done earlier, so so more people would have switched to Mastodon. But here it is, um, and then um, and then that's it. We can start wrapping things up, and I start packing my bags for Rome. Oh boy, oh boy! So next week the show is coming from Rome. I don't know how I'm going to do this with the jingles. Probably it'll just be a impromptu episode recorded on my phone. Maybe I'll even do like a video episode. Although, maybe not. Because <laughs> that, of course, would be very long to upload. Uh, and I only have mobile internet because usually I'm staying in a in a in a convent. Uh, so usually there's no internet, at least not in the in the guest quarters. So I'll be using my uh, my mobile uh, data. So I, no, I won't be uploading hours and hours of video content. <laughs> That's going to be very costly, but. I can maybe upload some some MP3s, or we'll see. Stay tuned. Um, I wish you a wonderful rest of your uh, Christmas time. Oh, by the way, take a look at my Lego uh, YouTube channel because I'll be posting some more videos about my about my Snowden Tardis. It's so much fun to build this little Christmas town. I don't think I'll be able to finish it before Christmas, but it's my first try. And I hope every year it will get more professional, more beautiful. But uh, take a look at uh, youtube.com slash brickpriest for that. All right. Happy third, way of ad for happy third week of Advent and talk to you next week. Alrighty then. That was a bit longer than I anticipated, but uh, it's good. It's seven o'clock. I am heading for the kitchen to make my pasta because I'm hungry. Um, thanks for stopping by. And the show, the audio version of the show will be available soon for both patrons and non-patrons. May the force be with you. Uh, live long and prosper. And... Uh, Take care of yourself, Frodo. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>